This is me, pretending there's no camera around. And next to me is a cup of hot water. And if you've never been to China, you might think I'm about to make tea or coffee, but I'm not. You see, in China, this is how most people prefer their water. Hot water is a staple here, and you can find it everywhere. In restaurants, hotels, airports, train stations, trains, even at the biggest political event of the year, the two sessions. And if you can get past the plain taste, you'll realize that this humble cup is infused with a rich history, although it didn't reach its peak popularity until recently. And today, we're diving right into it. Uh, the history, I mean, not the cup, because it's practically impossible. Welcome to Warm Water Gate. The case of hot water in China is actually a case against cold water. As many Chinese moms and aunties would tell you, a chill drink does a body bad. Stomach aches, sore throats, cramps, even diarrhea. You might think that this is just an old wife's tale, but ancient Chinese healers would disagree. This is Huang Di Nei Jing, the earliest and most influential written work of traditional Chinese medicine for over 2,300 years now. The book emphasizes on the importance of your body being in a state of balance, where the yin and yang, these complementary but opposing forces, are in perfect harmony. And diet plays an important part in this, because in TCM, your stomach loves warmth, and going against that by consuming cold beverages or cold food or even wearing thin clothes compromises the normal functions of digestion, absorption of nutrients, and leads to qi stagnation. And qi, by the way, is this vital life force that courses through your body. And bad qi is bad news for you because it can lead to illnesses, infertility, even death. And you don't want that. This aversion to cold water is not only recorded in medical books, but also in historical records. In 1883, Yuan Zuzhi, a writer and journalist, traveled from Shanghai to Europe on a trip that lasted 10 months. In The Theory of Contradictory Chinese and Western Customs, he wrote, Chinese people refrain from drinking cold water to avoid stomach troubles, while Westerners always indulge in cold water to beat the heat. Liquor for Chinese folks must be warm, while Westerners like it cold. Prevention is the best cure. That's one of the most important principles in TCM, but it's only one piece of a much larger and more intricate puzzle. For hot water to be hot, it needs heat. Mind-blowing. But that wasn't easy to come by in the past. You see, for the longest time, access to fuel was limited to the imperial family, officials, and the wealthy. This is documented in the diaries of a Japanese Buddhist monk called Enin, who traveled to China in the 9th century during the Tang Dynasty. He wrote about families in Shandong who did not cook soup to eat, but only ate cold dishes for years. Even when guests came, they served hollowed bread and cold dishes. Around the year 1000, charcoal in the city of Kaifeng, the capital of the Northern Song Dynasty, was 16 times more expensive than wheat, and six times pricier than rice. Even when boiled water was around, it was reserved for those truly in need, like the sick, the elderly, and pregnant women. But things did get better in the following decades, and by the southern Song Dynasty, firewood became more common in houses. In A Dream of Sorghum, Wu Zemu, a writer from that era, listed the seven necessities that every household cannot avoid, starting with firewood, but also rice, oil, salt, soy sauce, vinegar, and tea. And speaking of tea, I just want to take a moment to discuss the connection between China's tea culture and China's habit of drinking hot water. There's this general idea that since China loves tea and tea loves boiled water, then China must love boiled water too. I don't know what I just did, but that's the connection. Actually, the development of these two traditions happened separately and at different timelines. Tea culture emerged much, much earlier in China and reached its peak in the Song era, when tea became for everyone, from the literati to the commoner. Tea houses and tea vendors popped up, and even tea competitions were held for sellers to show off their skills and the quality of their drinks. I'm not saying that there couldn't be some form of correlation between the two, 
and somehow perhaps this popularity of tea did influence China's affinity for hot water. But it's also worth noting that in other tea-loving cultures, from Persia to Korea, people did not end up converting to straight-up hot H2O. In modern times, if you wanted water, you turn the faucet on and done. But in the past, water didn't come to people. People have to go to water, to lakes, rivers, wells, and when there's demand, there's always a business opportunity. Enter the water carriers. They were the original home delivery folks, crossing the city with water on their shoulders or in wheelbarrows. In Tianjin, for example, this line of work dates back to the 1400s. And when Lawrence Oliphant, a British diplomat, visited Tianjin in 1858, he noted that most common commodities sold on the street were water and firewood. Along with the water carriers, there were also water shops, which provided not just any water, but hot water. These businesses offered convenience and an affordable alternative to keeping stoves at home running outside of meal times. On the menu, there were two main categories of water. Raw water, or water that hasn't been boiled, and boiled water. Boiled water was in turn divided into boiling, warm, and cooled. And depending on what the customer needs, let's say water for washing face or making tea, the seller would mix and match between these different kinds to get the right temperature. Even when water pipes and communal taps were installed in neighborhoods, water shops remained in demand, with hundreds, even thousands in some cities by the 1950s. And it wasn't until faucets became common home fixtures that these shops began to gradually disappear in the 80s and 90s. Drinking hot water today might be a matter of preference, but it was born out of necessity. And one of the biggest boosts for this practice in China came from an unlikely source, cholera. It was one of the most dreaded diseases of the 19th and early 20th centuries, and much like elsewhere in the world, China wasn't immune to it. There were 46 outbreaks of varying degrees in China from 1817 to 1934, and the disease continued to make the rounds until the late 40s infecting and killing countless people. What the cholera did was that it changed how city authorities approached water supply and management. Rivers were the main source for domestic water, but rivers were also polluted with waste and sewage. And so in order to prevent disease, river water needed to be treated. And I know it sounds like I'm stating the obvious here, but at the time it was a big revelation. And so cue in a string of PSAs on how to make water safe for consumption. In 1907, the Qing government told the citizens of Tianjin, boiled tap water is always ideal for drinking. Do not make any exceptions. Even after China took off its imperial robe and stepped into its Republican era, the reminders continued. Throughout the 1920s, disease prevention authorities would take out space in newspapers to dispense advice. One announcement in 1922 read, never drink unboiled river water. You can very easily get sick if you drink it absolutely do not drink ice water. In another, they said that the sale of all cold foods such as ice water, hot jelly, and dried apricot juice mixed with block ice, whatever that is, is completely prohibited. Violators even risked having their businesses shot, getting fined, and even sent to hard labor. A little bit too intense if you ask me, but this goes to show how hot water was becoming a matter of public health, and for some, the difference between life and death. The habit of drinking warm water really benefited from this push to make people drink boiled water. Over the years, there were many public health campaigns that tried to make boiling water before consumption trendy, although it did take a few tries. In 1934, under the rule of nationalists, this man, Chiang Kai-shek, introduced the New Life Movement. It can only be described as a government-sponsored etiquette course, which Chiang believed held the key for national salvation. The campaign touched on virtually every aspect of daily life. Excuse yourself when you bump into someone. Walk on the left side of the street. Let women pass first. Sit straight when you're eating. Don't drink water if unboiled. The campaign was a failure, mainly because it was too utopian for the reality of China at the time, which was in a state of turmoil. In parallel with that, the Communist Party, which was at war with Chiang, was also advising supporters in villages to go for boiled water. 
The direction even applied to the Red Army, with soldiers caught drinking untreated water even reprimanded. And when the Communist Party took control and founded the People's Republic in 1949, they launched a new era of campaigns that focused on public hygiene and sanitation. Posters were plastered everywhere, teaching folks how to keep their villages clean, warning about the dangers of mosquito-borne diseases, and showing kids how to develop good habits. Naturally, water hygiene took center stage. Illustrations showed women pouring steaming water into porcelain pots, school kids reaching to insulated hot water dispensers, and mothers filling up thermoses with piping hot liquid. The slogan might have been, drink boiled water, but the photos mostly showed people enjoying warm water. And this call to action was coupled with action taken by the government itself. Schools and factories were equipped with tea and water stoves, communal kitchens in the villages served up hot water to combat pesky diseases, and doctors were dispatched to show people up close what lurked in untreated water. This mass mobilization wasn't just a sanitary movement, it was also a patriotic one, because observing cleanliness, food hygiene, and vaccination was as much about protecting the public's health as it was about ensuring the nation's health. Remember, this was a time when China was focused on production and increasing productivity. And so, slowly but surely, everyone became familiar with the mantra He Kai Shui, or drink boiled water. And when thermoses took off in China, there was really no turning back. They made ideal wedding gifts, accompanied college students to their dorms, and in some parts of the countryside, they were more common than flashlights. Thanks to them, water was only a twist of a cap away. And as they say, the rest is history. So there you have it. It might have taken hot water a bit of simmering to reach its boiling point in China, but it truly became a national passion. And like, don't get me wrong, Chinese people do drink cold stuff. It's not like warm water is the only legally binding way to stay hydrated. But like almost everyone I know grew up drinking warm water and continues to do so. There's so much nostalgia around this practice that even marketers try to cash in on. Like this perfume called the Yangbai Kai or cooled boiled water, and this bottled water brand, also the Yangbai Kai. And hot water is so iconic that it even made its way into everyday language. Duo He Re Shui, or drink more hot water, is what you will hear when you're not feeling well, regardless of why you're not feeling well. So think of it as less of a medical advice and more of a way for a Chinese person to show they care. But it's so casually thrown here and there, left and right, that one survey found it to be the number one thing that Chinese women cannot stand in a relationship. It's even worse than whatever, it's all my fault, and ugh, what now? And when something becomes a meme, you know that it has forever captured the imagination of people. Like, that's it. This is the pinnacle of culture. It's a phenomenon. And with this, I come to the end of this video. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did researching it. It took a lot of time to piece this together, but I'm happy that I was able to make a video out of it. I have been wanting to make video essays for a while now, and so... If you like this and have other ideas, let me know in the comments section. This was all from me for this week. I will see you next time. Until then, 多喝热水, and 再见。